Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Life Everlasting on Death, comma, Dying, and the Future Hope. This lesson, number five in this series for October 29 of 2022, is entitled Resurrections Before the Cross. So we're getting closer and closer to talk about you know, the real resurrections, the, what God's promised the future, and so forth. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, the hope of resurrection is a wonderful hope, not just resurrection, but translation for those who are still living to get those new bodies that will be so much better than what we have now, to think that Adam was more than twice as tall as men now living, just imagine looking up at him and, and Eve when we first see them. Amazing. But we will grow up to be like them. And so we look forward to that grand, glorious day, and may it be soon, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In previous discussions, we noted that several Old Testament prophets, including Moses, David, Daniel, talk about a future resurrection expected for God's people. Daniel even mentions a resurrection for the wicked in addition to that for the righteous. Jim? Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. It was faith that made Abraham offer his son Isaac to a, a sacrifice when God put Abraham to the test. Abraham was the one to whom God had made the promise, yet he was ready to offer his only son as a sacrifice. God had said to him, it is through Isaac that you will have the descendants I promised. Abraham reckoned that God was able to raise Isaac from, the de from death, and so to speak, Abraham did receive Isaac back from the death. American Bible Society, Good News Bible. Okay, so what would you say? Would you consider the Mount Moriah story that we just mentioned? With Abraham Isaac, would you consider that a resurrection story? Or a non-death story? <laughs> a non-death story, okay. Would that be the same resurrection as non-death? Well, he must have had some idea that God would resurrect. Uh, resurrect. Yeah. So he, yeah, he but then it says that. But he told the servant, and we shall return. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, I... It's hard to p remember where things are, but you know, Hebrews 11 has that explicitly. Yeah. Ellen White talks about that, and but it's not said in Genesis. It doesn't explain where, where this idea came from. No. We just... Okay, Carrie? Yes, from the Bible study guide. The first resurrection was of Moses. That's the first one we know about, okay? okay. From Jude 9, Luke 9, 28 to 36. During Israel's monarchy, the son of the widow of Zarephath, 1 Kings 17, 8 to 24, and the Shunammite son, 2 Kings 4, 18 to 37, also were resurrected. Christ, when here in the flesh, surrendered the son of the widow of Nain, Luke 7, 11 to 17. Jairus' daughter, Luke 8, 40 to 56, and then Lazarus, John 11. Except for Moses, all these people were raised as mortals who eventually would die again. These cases also confirm the biblical teaching of the unconsciousness of the dead, from Job 3, 11 to 13, Psalms 115, 17, Psalms 146, 4, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 to 10. In none of these accounts, nor in any other biblical resurrection narratives, is there any mention of a supposed afterlife experience. That's from our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon, October 20. Okay, now, <clears throat> Jude 9. We, let's just look at that real quick. Jude 9. Not even the chief angel Michael did this in his quarrel with the devil. Here we have, guess what? Michael quarreling with the devil. When they argued about who would have the body of Moses, 
Michael did not dare to condemn the devil with insulting words, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And then in Luke 9, we have the story, which we won't read the whole story right now, of the transfiguration on the top of the mountain. And who was there with Jesus? Elijah Moses. and Moses. Elijah and Moses. So there he is. So now I have a question for you. The only references to the resurrection and or ascension of Moses are found in the New Testament and the passages listed above. How did these New Testament authors, by the way, who wrote Jude? The brother of Jesus. A young, older brother of Jesus. And who wrote Luke? Luke. 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 The, neither one the, of the, huh? The Greek Luke. Yes. And neither one of these people were uh, part of the disciples. Neither one of them were there at the time of the transfiguration. How did they know all this information? Well, let, let, let me spell that out a little bit for you. The only references to the resurrection and or ascension of Moses are found in the New Testament in the passages listed above. How did these New Testament authors find out about it? How did these accounts compare with Deuteronomy 34? And you know Deuteronomy 34, we'll look at it a little bit later, but God took him up the mountain, he buried him, and later on he resurrected him. Doesn't this story about Moses support the idea that people go to heaven immediately after, upon their death? How should we answer someone who believes that? Okay, how, how as long has this been an issue? A long time. Okay. From the Bible study guide, some Greek church fathers from Alexandria argued that when Moses died, two Moseses were seen, one alive in the spirit, another dead in the body. <laughs> one Moses ascended to heaven with angels, the other buried in the earth. And that's from C. Origen homilies on Joshua 2.1 <clears throat> and Clement of Alexandria, Stramata 6.15. This distinction between the assumption of the soul and the burial of the body might make sense to those who believe in the Greek concept of the immortal soul, but the idea is not in the Bible. Jude 9 confirms a biblical teaching of the resurrection of Moses' body because the dispute was, quote, about the body of Moses and not about any supposed surviving soul. So um, now Sunday if, Bible study guide. Yeah. If supposedly what matters is the soul that ascends to heaven, why would Jesus come down as Michael, the archangel, and have a battle with the devil over Moses' body? What would be the point? Wouldn't make any sense, would it? Oh, there are a number of. It must be a typo. Must be a typo. <laughs> I see. Okay. Thought of, thought of. <laughs> There are a number of incidents in the Bible where Christ Jesus was in direct conflict with the devil. Let's think about some of them. What ones can you name? Well, some obvious examples are, of course, the war in heaven back in the beginning, Revelation 12. The conflict over the body of Moses. We're trying to look at them chronologically here. The conflict over the body of Moses. It's mentioned in Jude 9, but it happened way back there, the death of Moses. Three, the argument over the control of Cyrus in Daniel 10. Four, the temptations of Christ in the wilderness. Five, the trials and crucifixion of Christ. And six, the resurrection of Christ on Sunday morning with Christ arising in his own power while Satan was doing everything he could to keep Christ in the grave. Those are just ones that sort of come to th off the top of my head. Times when there was direct confrontation between Christ and the devil. And how often did the devil win? Not once. Never. I think another one was actually on the walls of Jerusalem when uh, the Assyrians confronted oh. the God of Israel. Yeah. The Assyrian God confronted the God of Israel. Okay, and that's then 185,000 Assyrians were dead. Yeah. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the, for the story there in Luke, Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus and talked with him. Moses represented those people who have died and then will be resurrected to go to heaven. Elijah represented those people who will be translated without dying. Were these two really human beings talking to Jesus or were they some kind of spirits? Come on, I need some answers here. 
Well, did Moses, who had died, have a different, here's an even tougher question. Did Moses, who had died, have a different kind of existence in heaven than did Elijah, who was translated? We're not given information on that. Okay. But they were translated. I'm not, anyway. <laughs> hmm? But they were translated. They, that's Elijah was translated. Going, that's right. What's going to happen to us as well. So there's not going to be different grades of humanity, I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Well, the report of Elijah's translation, of course, is found in 2 Kings 2, 1 through 12. We're not going to uh, go there right now. We'll talk about that later. From the writings of Williams e. White, uh, EGW, Christ himself, with the angels who had buried Moses, came down from Notice who's, who buried Moses? Christ and the angels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Came down from heaven to call forth the sleeping saint. For the first time, Christ was about to give life to the dead. As the prince of life and the shining one approached the grave, Satan was alarmed for his supremacy. Christ did not stoop to enter into the controversy with Satan, but Christ referred all his uh, all to his father saying lord rebuke you jude 9. the res resurrection was forever made certain satan was despoiled of his prey the righteous dead would live again helen white patriarchs and prophets page 478. okay that's a very interesting situation okay here is proof that god can come down to the earth and resurrect a dead person and take them to heaven. Well, because of his sin at Kadesh Barnea and misrepresenting God to the people, Moses was not allowed to enter the earthly Canaan. God felt it was necessary to discipline him in this way because of his sin. And of course, that would be primarily as an example to the people. Instead, but, he went to the heavenly Canaan. Okay, but do notice what God did for Moses before he died. Deuteronomy 34, 1-4, Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Mount Pisgah. Now, I, when I was younger, I wondered, well, what, was it Nebo or was it Pisgah? Well, it turns out that Pisgah is just a name for a peak. It just means a peak. He went up to the top of Mount Nebo to the peak east of Jordan. And there the Lord showed him the whole land. The territory of Gilead as far north as the town of Dan, the entire territory of Naphtali, the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh, the territory of Judah as far west as the Mediterranean Sea, the southern part of Judah and the plain that reaches from Zoar to, Zer to Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob I would give to their descendants. I have let you see it, but I will not let you go there. That's good news Bible. So, the question that Gordon has already mentioned, would you prefer to go to one, the earthly Canaan, or two, the heavenly Canaan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't need to be any discussion. I'll take door two. <laughs> you take door yeah. two. Okay. There are a number of miraculous events reported in the Old Testament. Both the Elijah and Elisha are reported to have been instrumental in resurrections of young boys. 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24 describes Elijah as traveling to Zarephath, living with the widow and her son. When the widow's son died, Elijah exercised God, exercising God's power, raised him back to life. Elisha's story is told in 2 Kings 4, 18 to 37. A very kind and generous family, an apparently fairly wealthy family, had become acquainted with Elijah and ever even built a small room near their house for him to stay in when he passed that way. And by the way, they lived almost in the center of the land, so would, he would probably be passing that way fairly often. Um, as a result, Elisha asked the family uh, what he could do for them. The woman said that they would like a son. Later, the boy was born. Years later, the boy developed a terrible headache. And for those of us who have lived in that part of the world, uh, we immediately think of cerebral malaria. While working or in the any meningitis. Or it could be, uh, certainly meningitis is another or, part. Or bleeding in the brain. Yes, or bleeding in the brain, okay. Because Make a list. How fast it came on. Yeah. Um, and was taken home to his mother where he soon died. 
The woman, realizing that Elisha had been the one who promised that sign, insisted on going straight to Elisha to report what happened. When Elisha came and stretched himself over the body of the boy, the boy came back to life. So now we have these two stories. So how do these two stories compare and contrast? Well, the first was done by God through Elijah, the second by God through Elisha. So one was Elijah, the other was Elisha. In each case, a well-known woman received back her male child. In the case of Elisha, it was a son that had been given to her miraculously. In the case of Elijah, the woman, her son, and Elijah had been miraculously fed for a long time during the drought. Now, anyway, the first woman was a Phoenician widow, while the second was an Israelite married woman. Both of these resurrections were only a return to life on this earth, not to have an, an eternal life. So why did God choose to resurrect these two young men when he did not choose to resurrect others? And so here's my questions now for you. Why do you think Elijah was hiding right under the nose of Jezebel's father, who was the king and high priest of Baal, living in Sidon only a few miles from where Elijah was staying? So going back just a tad, maybe these weren't the only two that were raised to life, it's but they're the only two recorded. Yeah, that's in a possibility. The Bible. Yeah. And if, if there were others, why were these two recorded mm -hmm. and not others? Mm -hmm. Or if these are the only two, why are they the only two? Mm -hmm. um, now, th th these, aren't the, these aren't the wealthy class. Well, I guess the Sh Shunammite family was kind of wealthy, but they weren't the ruling class. They weren't no. the king's family. No. They were... Ordinary people. Somewhat ordinary people. So let me just ask you a question. What do you think the people of Zarephath thought when a man from Israel suddenly shows up and moves in with a widow and her son? <laughs> Would that raise any questions in your mind? Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, that may not work well for pastors nowadays. Well, it even more amazing is that everybody else is starving and these three in this house have food. Did, they, did, didn't that raise questions in anybody's mind? But they don't have a lot there. It just keeps showing up. It well, but they still up. had it. I mean, they were still eating and everybody else was starving. Now, we need to be honest, Zarephath is located right on the Mediterranean coast. It's a sea town. Fishing village, huh? Well, does this mean there were no fish in the sea? Did the drought extend all the way to the Mediterranean? This is outside of Israelite territory. So this is a modern Tyre and Sidon? I mean, during Jesus' Not time? Not too far. In, okay. in Greek times, it was called Sarepta instead of Zarephath. And okay. The Greeks can't say Zarephath. They don't have F and they don't have TH. Well, they do have TH, I'm sorry. Another miracle not involving an actual, actual resurrection is recorded regarding Elisha in 2 Kings 4, 1 to 7. A widow who was unable to pay her debts had those, actually the debts from her husband, had those debts relieved when she sold miraculously produced olive oil. Elisha had told her to borrow as many pots as she could, could and pour olive oil from her small jar into them. Then she was able to sell the olive oil and pay her debts. The olive oil just kept coming. Just kept coming. Another unusual resurrection story that's not usually mentioned is found in 2 Kings 13, 20 through 21. Okay. That's my, no, that's, is that yours or did you do the last one? 2 Kings. Uh, it's mine, I think. 2 Kings 13, 20 and 21. Elisha died and was buried. Every year, this is from our Bi Good News Bible, Every year, bands of Moabites used to invade the land of Israel. Once during a funeral, one of those bands was seen and the people threw the corpse into Elisha's tomb and ran off. As soon as the body came into contact with Elisha's bones, the man came back to life and stood up. I want you to think about what would happen next. The man manages to get himself out of his clothes that he's wrapped in. 
he, he goes to the entrance of the cave and there's the raiding Moabites coming there and his friends are back over here and he, he says, wait for me, wait for me. And I don't know whether they, they would run faster run because faster. here's a dead man coming yeah. or whether they, they'd run faster because, but I wish we had the rest of that story. <laughs> anyway, why, here's a big question. Why were there so many, and there's lots of other miracles as you know, so many miracle stories connected to the lives of Elijah and Elisha who lived in the northern country of Israel during very difficult and mostly pagan times <coughs> and at a time when the people were mostly worshiping Baal. I think to me, there was not one, one king, northern king who followed the Lord, not one. That's correct. And the Lord desperately wanted to show them that they were His children. All they needed to do is to turn to Him. And we have Elijah and the story of Mount Carmel, don't we? And we have others, other, several other miracle stories that happened. Now, I think this case of Elijah's bones was specifically to teach the people, now maybe the prophets are dead, Elijah's dead. Elisha is now dead, but their power, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, is still active because of what they did. I, I think this is a way of saying, you know, God hasn't died in the northern kingdom of Israel. He's still there if you're willing to, if you're willing to listen to Him. But those weren't magic bones. Maybe we should dig them up and see if they still work. But they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> no, they weren't. So. It was the power of God. We know many stories about the ministry of Jesus. Let's come down, down to the New Testament. He was on one continual mission of healing, preaching, teaching, and converting sinners. Jim? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Peter said, You know about Jesus of Nazareth and how God poured out on him the Holy Spirit and power. He went everywhere doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. Good News Bible. Ellen White says, There were whole villages where there was not a moan of sickness in any house, for he had passed through them and healed all their sick. His wow. His work gave evidence of his divine anointing. Love, mercy, and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. His heart went out in tender sympathy to the children of men. He took man's nature that he might reach man's wants. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, page 11 and 12. Okay, now my question. What do you think would happen what would be the reaction in the city today if Jesus passed through and healed every diseased and disabled person? I have written, told this story, I've suggested, I've raised this question in different contexts. What do you think would happen if today Jesus appeared and walked through Lumlin University Medical Center right over here and healed everybody in the hospital and sent them home? Now, my question for, of course, the, you know. That's trauma. Huh? Massive trauma, the, the bean counters would try to figure out, well, in the world they're going to f function for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, but what I want to, the question I want to ask you, how would it be reported in the newspaper and on TV? Well, if it's in newspapers and TV, you probably can't believe whatever they're going to peddle. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't tell That's the truth. That's a rather jaundiced way of looking. Do you, think, do you think the place would be swarming with news reporters trying to figure out what happened? It has happened with, with pa Baby Faye. Swarming with patients the next day. Yeah. I mean, everybody would, I would think, yeah, the next day the hospital would be jammed. They would say, you know, is he coming back? Me too. Me but, too. But Jesus had said somewhere, he says, you're going to do greater things. Mm -hmm. And we're still looking forward to that day. Yep. If you were sick, now here's another question along that same line. If you were sick and you watched Jesus heal a number of other people who were sick in your town, would it increase your faith that he could heal you? 
I would certainly think so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I'm not going to take, well, let's go ahead and read Luke 7, 11 to 17. Carrie? Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, accompanied by his disciples and a large crowd. Just as he arrived at the gate of the town, a funeral procession was coming out. The dead man was the only son of a woman who was a widow, mm. and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart was filled with pity for her, and he said to her, Don't cry. Then he walked over and touched the coffin, and the men carrying it stopped. Jesus said, Young man, get up, I tell you. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now let's hold on for a second. I want you to think about, I mean, these guys were probably carrying the coffin on their shoulders. Yeah. Okay. Probably an open... Probably an open, yeah, it was an open casket, I'm sure. Oh, or just a... Just, yeah, probably just a, stretcher. Just, a, just a stretcher kind of thing, yeah. Like the uh, people in that part of the world do now. Yeah. Even now. Yeah. What do you suppose would happen if Jesus walked up, touched the man, and all of a sudden he sits up and <laughs> starts talking? <laughs> That's basically what happened. Yeah. What did the, poor, what did the guys say were carrying him? I mean, I, I like to think about these stories. And there's huge crowds. I mean, there's a big crowd following Jesus. The whole all, people from the town are all following the woman coming out. Okay, go ahead. What, what was Nain? Do you know by name? Yes. Um, there's a major valley that goes through the central part of Galilee. It uh, goes all the way out to the coast. Uh, uh, this is just a rough idea. Basically, Nazareth and some of those other towns like that were located on the southern side of that valley. Nain was located almost starting up the mountains on the northern side of that thing, and then clear at the, I'm doing it backwards for you people watching, from, clear on the, at the edges, of course, was uh, Sea of Galilee and Capernaum. So if you sort of did a looping thing like this, you could go from, Nazareth to Nain to Capernaum. Okay, you want to go ahead and... Where are we here? Six the dead man set up. They, my turn, is it? Yeah. They, they all were filled with fear and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to save his people. This news about Jesus went out through all the country and the surrounding territory from the Good News Bible. Okay. More than 20 miles from Capernaum on a tableland overlooking the wide, beautiful plain of Esdraelon lay the village of Nain. And thither Jesus next bent his steps. Many of his disciples and others were with him. And all along the way, the people came, longing for his words of love and pity and bringing their sick for his healing, and ever with the hope that he who wielded such wondrous power would make himself known as the King of Israel. A multitude thronged his steps, and it was a glad, expectant company that followed him up the rocky path toward the gate of the mountain village. As they draw near, a funeral train is seen coming from the gates. With slow, sad steps, it is proceeding to the place of burial. On an open bier carried in front is the body of the dead, and about it are the mourners, filling the air with their wailing cries. All the people of the town seem to have gathered to show their respect for the dead and their sympathy with the bereaved. It was a sight to awaken sympathy. The disease was the only son of his mother and she was a widow. The lonely mourner was followed to the grave, her sole earthly support and comfort. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. As she moved on blindly, weeping, noting not his presence, he claimed close beside her and gently said, weep not. Jesus was about to change her grief to joy Yet he could not forbear this expression of tender sympathy. 
He came to touch the Maya. To him even contact with the dead could impart no defilement. The bearer stood still and the lamentations of the mourners ceased. The two companies gathered about the bier, hoping against hope. One was present who had banished disease and vanished, vanquished rather de demons. Was death also subject to his power? In clear, authoritative voice, the words are spoken. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. The voice pierces the ears of the dead. The young man opens his eyes. Jesus takes him by the hand and lifts him up. His gaze falls upon her who has been weeping beside him, and mother and son unite in a long, clean, clinging, joyous embrace. The multitude look on in silence as if spellbound. There came a fear on all. Hushed and reverent, they stood for a little time as if in the very presence of God. Then they... Uh, why were they in the, in the, in the, they were in the very presence of God? Right. Okay. Uh, very, there it is. Then they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God hath visited his people. The funeral train returned to Naim as a triumphal procession, and this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout the region round about. That's from the Desire of Ages, page 318, 1 through 5. Now that quote about Judea and so forth is straight out of the Bible. A miracle had actually taken place in Galilee, not in Judea. However, word spread quickly even to Judea. So this passage in Darabe just seemed to suggest that, D, that Jesus, followed by a large crowd of witnesses, traveled to Nain intentionally to perform this miracle. Why would he have done that? Well, think about the story of the healing of the demon-possessed daughter of the Syrophoenician woman who was not even an Israelite and lived outside of Jewish territory. Jesus traveled a long way out there to, to heal her. <clears throat> And this was shortly before he went to the cross, if I remember it right. Which one? That going to uh, the Syrophoenician woman. It was about uh, maybe nine months or so. Okay. And they traveled about two hundred miles. Quite a long way. Both the Phoenician woman who lived in Zarephath and the Shunammite woman in Israel had asked for help and received it from Elijah and Elisha, but the widow of Nain had not even asked for help. Yet Jesus went out of his way to raise her only means of support. Almost reminds you of uh, Jesus forgiving the people who crucified him even though they didn't ask. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> James 1.27 reminds us that the true religion involves caring for orphans and widows. In the Bible study guide, the resurrections prior to Jesus' own death and resurrection <laughs> were not limited to any specific ethnic group or social class. Moses was perhaps the greatest human leader of God's people ever. By contrast, the poor Phoenician widow was not even an Israelite. The Shunammite woman was prominent in her community. The widow of Nain had only one son upon whom she was probably dependent. That's dependent for uh, financial support yeah. uh, for the rest of her life. Yeah. In contrast, Jairus was the ruler of a synagogue, probably in Capernaum. Regardless of their different cultural backgrounds or social status, all of them were blessed by God's life-giving power from the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. So, once again, we need to ask questions. Why did God, in this case Jesus, choose to raise these particular individuals? Clearly, there were thousands of others that he could have raised, but did not, and no doubt, hundreds and maybe thousands of miracles that Jesus performed, of which we know nothing. We don't, we had, we, you know, John said what? If all the books were written, it would, there wouldn't be enough ink, there wouldn't be enough pages, right? And we remember that Jesus sent the disciples out to raise the dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why did the apostles record these miracles, these particular miracles? But Why? I, on number 25, mm -hmm. I don't think, I, it's not in the scriptures, but I just kind of picture my Lord just saying, well, this one, I'm not going to raise him. I'm going to walk past him. 
No. I think he stopped every funeral that was along his way. I mean, we do not know. Yeah. The scriptures don't say that. But. Well, Ellen White seems to suggest that he went sort of a little bit out of his way just specifically on this case. I think so. Yeah. yeah I, I thoroughly agree. Mm. Yes. Mark 25, Mark 5, 21 to 24. We're, when we're going to ask the question, why did Jesus repeatedly call death a sleep? Sleep, yes. Mark 5, 21 to 24, 35 through 43. Jesus went back across to the other side of the lake. There at the lakeside, a large crowd gathered around him. Jairus, an official of the local synagogue, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he threw himself down at his feet and begged him for um, him earnestly. My little daughter is very sick. Please come and place your hands on her so that she will get well uh, and live. Live. Jesus, live. Uh, Jesus, then Jesus started off with him. So many people were going along with Jesus that they were crowding him from every side. Well, Jesus was saying this, some messengers came from Jairus' house and told him, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? Jesus paid no attention to what they said, but told him, don't be afraid, only believe. Then he did not let anyone else go with him except Peter, James, and his brother John. They arrived at Jairus' house where Jesus saw the confusion and heard all the loud crying and wailing. He went in and said to them, why all this confusion? Why are you crying? The child is not dead. She's only sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can imagine. <laughs> they laughed at him. But, They're but crying. The doctors had laughing. declared her dead. That's right. <laughs> yes. They're crying, and then suddenly they're laughing at him. They laughed at him. So he put them all out, took the child's father and mother and his three disciples, and went up to the room where the child was lying. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, Kom, which means, little girl, I tell you to get up. She got up at once and started walking around. She was 12 years old. When this happened, they were completely amazed, but Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone. And he said, give her something to eat. Okay, there's two things I want us to notice about that story. This girl had been sick for a while, probably had had nothing to eat for a long time. So Jesus' first concern is about the little girl. And then the next concern is, he told his disciples and his parents, don't tell anyone. There are hundreds of people already there mourning. There was no way they could keep the resurrection a secret. So what was he talking about? Was it something about the actual process that Jesus did not want them to tell? Why would he say don't, I mean, you can't even get out of the house until people know that the girl is, is, is alive again. He didn't want the opposition to interfere with him spreading the word to the rest of Israel and, and Judah. Ellen White suggests, and connected to other stories where he made this statement that he, you know, if, this, if the word just spread like wildfire, that he had all these abilities, he wouldn't be able to do what he came to this, to this earth to do. Every people would just be And so apparently what he's telling them here is, don't just go and tell everybody so they just come flocking in. Just keep it as quiet as possible. At least that's one possibility. Try to imagine the thoughts of Jesus as he approached the house of Jairus. He knew perfectly well what he was about to do. When he told people they, the child was not dead but sleeping, they ridiculed him because, one, they knew that she was dead. And two, they clearly did not understand the full meaning of his words. The comforting metaphor by which sleep stands for death seems to have been Christ's favorite way of referring to this experience. We're going to talk about John 11 a little bit. Death is a sleep but it is a deep sleep from which only the great life giver can awaken one, for he alone has the keys to the tomb. And that's Revelation 1.18, John 3.16, Romans 6.23, etc. 
And this is from an article in the Adventist Bible Commentary. <clears throat> in other words, if one has the powers that Jesus had, death is nothing more than a sleep, right? Yeah. If you can just speak the word and a person wakes up no matter what their condition is, then death is no more than a sleep, right? And here Jesus again and again says, Lazarus is sleeping. This little girl is sleeping. So what's going on in the Christian world? It brings me back again yeah. and again to the same thing. I mean, uh, yeah, dead, go straight to heaven or straight go to hell. And go to hell, you're there forever and ever and ever. I mean, how so far? to us, death seems so final. However, Jesus, it wasn't like that. Yeah. If you just died, well, you're okay, sleeping. you're appropriate. Rise again. Is it still okay to, for us to accept the words of Jesus when he said to Martha, do not be afraid, only believe? Read the story of the resurrection of Lazarus recorded in John 11, 1 to, 17, 1 to 44, and I can see we're not going to have time to do that. Hopefully that story is relatively familiar to you. It is a important to understand that Jesus was approaching the end of his ministry. Jew the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem were determined to arrest him and, if possible, kill him. And then been trying to do that since his first year. Okay, we're going to mention that right now. The Pharisees had been wanting to arrest and kill Jesus for years already. At the time of the first, his first Jerusalem visit during his ministry, when he cleansed the temple, Ellen White says, they went and went into council. They said, we must rid ourselves of this man. They wanted to kill him right there. But the Sadducees did not pay much attention to Jesus. They chose to believe that there's nothing beyond this life, so they made the most of life while they could. However, when Jesus raised Lazarus just a few miles from Jerusalem and in the full view of many people from Jerusalem, it was no longer possible for the Sadducees who were primarily the priestly class, to ignore Jesus who had, done, had just disproved one of their favorite teachings. After this event, almost the entire ruling council of the Sanhedrin was in favor of eliminating Jesus. But wasn't this a climactic time as well? Weren't there people from all over the world? Uh, this Passover was only a week ago away or so. This wasn't actually a Passover time, but... But uh, there were a lot of people yes. there, and uh, Jesus knowingly dragged his feet to make sure that he was dead for four yep. days. Okay, let's talk about that. It's important to notice that in the story of the raising of Lazarus, that Jesus clarified even to his own disciples what he meant when he said that Lazarus was sleeping. He meant that Lazarus was dead. And additional bit of information, in the days of Jesus, it was generally believed that a person's spirit waited around the body for three days after the person died, just in case the person might somehow be revived or awakened. So Jesus intentionally waited until the fourth day so there would be no question about Lazarus being dead. The smell confirmed the fact. So, I mean, I don't think there's any way you can escape the idea that Jesus did this intentionally. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, clearly believed that Jesus as God, Jesus as God, would have the power to resurrect the righteous and even the wicked at the second or third coming. But Jesus was not going to wait until that time to raise Lazarus. Do we believe that Jesus still has the power to raise the people from the dead? I personally know of two stories from people I know personally involving modern-day Seventh-day Adventists in two different parts of the world in which people were raised from the dead. This is not something that happens often and not in places where people are very critical and scientifically minded. So you can draw your own conclusions about that. Okay, Jim? John 15, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am John the 11, actually. What did I say? John, 15. John 11, yeah. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And all those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Good News Bible. Okay, now time for a little exegesis. What is exegesis? 
something out. Try to get to drag out the real meaning of the verse, right? How do you understand these verses? First, Jesus said that those who believe in him, even though they die, will live. Okay? But then he said, all those who live and believe in me will never die. John eleven twenty six. 26, we just read it. Why that apparent contradiction? Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. It's from 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He that believeth in me, said Jesus, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Christ here in John 11, 25 to 26 looks forward to the time of his second coming. Then the righteous dead shall be raised incorruptible and the living righteous shall be translated to heaven without seeing death. The miracle which Christ was about to perform in raising Lazarus from the dead would represent the resurrection of all the righteous dead. By his word and his works, he declared himself the author of the resurrection. He who himself was soon to die upon the cross stood with the keys of death, a conqueror of the grave, and asserted his right and power to give eternal life. Wow. Desire Ages, 530, page, paragraph 3. Okay, well, you rushed past my last question, so I've got another one for you now. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was fully aware of the thoughts and aims of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He knew that raising Lazarus from the dead would seal his fate in the eyes of the Sanhedrin. Why did he choose to perform this miracle so close to Jerusalem and in the full sight of so many people from Jerusalem? Was Jesus just baiting them? Um, I think about, who was the high priest Caiaphas? Mm -hmm. I think about his words. It is expedient for one man to die than the entire nation perish. Yep. What he was saying, and if you read between the lines, what he was saying, if the word gets out about yeah. this Jesus, right. the whole world's going to follow after him. Right. Because and he didn't want, say, praise the Lord, yeah. as a cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they want the Romans nah. out anyways. They were going to be out of a job. Yeah. Typhus says, you, we're, we're yeah. just, we, we, who we're needs done. us? We're done. You got a guy that heals the sick, raising the dead. Yeah, feeds, feeds the, what are we, the multitudes. Yeah, maybe the thousands of people. Who needs, uh, who needs us? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, Gordon. <clears throat> From the Bible Study Guide, many writers over the centuries have written about the futility of a life that ends always in death. Along with other living creatures, that is chickens, beavers, oysters, etc., we all die. However, for humans, in a sense, our predicament is worse than for the animals because we know that we are going to die. That's straight out of Ecclesiastes 9.5, okay? Chickens, beavers, and oysters don't. Why then is the promise of the resurrection so crucial to us? From the Bible study guide for Friday. If people are transformed in some way and their spirits or their souls live on after they die, would there be any need for a resurrection? What would be the reason for it? N note that the resurrection is probably the most frequently mentioned future hope in the entire New Testament. Charles? If many people, if Mm -hmm. What's this? Many expected to hear from Lazarus a wonderful account of senses witnessed after death. They were surprised that he told them nothing. He had nothing of this sort, of this kind to tell. Inspiration declares the dead know not anything. Their love and their hatred and their envy is ever perished. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6. But Lazarus did have a wonderful testimony to bear in regard to the work of Christ. He had been raised from the dead for this purpose. With assurance and power, he declared that Jesus was the Son of God. 
okay, I mean, imagine you say, what can Jesus do? Boom. Standing beside him is Lazarus. He's raised him from the dead. That's a pretty powerful argument. Yeah. Think of this such a situation. If someone called and asked, is Sally there? You might answer, yes, but she's sleeping. If our someone called and asked, is Sally there? You're not going to answer, yes, but she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? What does this teach us about the nature of death from a human standpoint? As far as we know, Moses was the very first person to be raised from the dead. Deuteronomy 34 gives an extensive description of his climb up Mount Nebo and his death in the land of Moab. Deuteronomy 34, uh, I'm just going to read the whole thing. That, that There's just a few verses in this whole chapter, so we get the whole picture. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Mount Pisgah, east of Jericho, and there the Lord showed him the whole land, the territory of Gilead as far north as the town of Dan, the entire territory of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, the territory of Judah as far, as west, far west as the Mediterranean Sea, the southern part of Judah and the plain that reaches from Zoar to Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob I would give to their descendants. I have let, thee see, I have let you see it, but I will not let you go there. So Moses, the Lord's servant, died there in the land of Moab, as the Lord had said he would. The Lord buried him in a valley in Moab, up opposite the town of Bethpeor, but to this day no one knows the exact place or site of his burial. Moses was 120 years old when he died. He was as strong as ever, and his eyesight was still good. The people of Israel mourned for him for 30 days in the plains of Moab. Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with wisdom and took his place, etc. Just jump back here. Who wrote the story about the death of Moses? Well, Moses wrote the books of Moses. Yes. But they had to, in the addendum, who knows, Joshua, perhaps? Probably. Joshua, uh, Moses certainly could not have done it himself. But then again, if, if that's the truth, if Joshua was the one who wrote it, how did Joshua know? Didn't Joshua go up the mountain partway with him? He or did on other before? occasions, but we have no evidence that he did on this occasion. Uh, how did he know about the details? And remember, we said that a couple of people way over in the New Testament are the ones who give us some of the details. This lesson has focused um, particularly on the stories of Moses, the son of the widow of Zarephath, the Shunammite widow's son, the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter, and especially the resurrection of Lazarus. Why do you think that none of those accounts include any words from the resurrected individuals about what happened to them or what they saw while they were dead? That shouldn't be a complicated question, right? It's they not, didn't apparently not the message that the Bible is wanting to present. Well, I mean, the point is they didn't have anything to say because nothing happened to them. They didn't see anything. They didn't hear anything. They didn't think anything. They, they didn't even dream a dream. Come to think. Yeah. But you know, I, just to bring this up though, that they base my, our friends, and I'm sure we are Protestant friends. They base their beliefs on one parable. That's of Lazarus. Yeah. The whole thing. Not the real Lazarus. The Not fake the Lazarus. real Lazarus. Different Lazarus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the Lord is taunting them also. He is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. I think he's, you know, Sadducees don't believe in this. And if these people actually died and went to heaven, wouldn't they, would they want to come back? Of course, there's some guy yeah. who says, uh, Paradise was, was a man's hairy chest. <laughs> the story was blessed. The bosom of Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting that the disciples, uh, the dispute, I'm sorry, over the body of Moses recorded in Jude 9 makes it clear that the argument was over his body. There was no discussion about a soul or a spirit. Daniel 12 strongly suggests that there are going to be two different and distinct resurrections, the first for the righteous and then the second for the wicked. There are some hints in the Bible and elsewhere that there's a special resurrection that it will involve a lot of the people who persecuted God. Let's, let's look at that. A special resurrection precedes Christ's second advent. 
All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message will arise at that time. In addition, so who would that include? People who had died in the faith of the third angel's message? Everyone is to be saved. Well, hold on. Hold those, on, wait. Those of us near the end. It would be those who lived after 1844, after the giving of the first angel's message, after the giving of the second angel's message, it wasn't until a while later that they even started talking about the third angel's message. So these would be people who've died fairly recently in the gospel, right? And those who knew something about the great controversy. Um, but in, it we also said, and, and, and those who beheld the, with mockery Christ's crucifixion and those who have most violently opposed the people of God will be brought forth from their graves to see the fulfillment of the divine promise and the triumph of truth. That's from uh, an article on Daniel 12 by F.T. Nichol and the STA Bible Commentary. Would it be correct to say that in the presence of God there is no such thing as death? Of course, in God's ideal, no death was to take place. Death came as a result of the rebellion of Satan. As we've already suggested, Jesus knew about the raising of Lazarus from the de dead. It was going to cause much animosity among the Jewish leaders. Why did he go ahead with that miracle? When he wept at the grave of Lazarus, he was weeping about what he knew what happened to all sinners. Um, I'm going to drop down here and I would encourage you to get a copy of our handout so that you can see some of the parts we didn't get a chance to discuss and get some good questions that you might want to talk about in your Sabbath school class with your friends. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to turn to you and think about you and discuss with you uh, these issues as presented in Scripture. Help us to know the truth about death, dying, and the hope beyond. May we soon, all of us, be a participants in that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.